Hey there, pre-med. In this video, we're gonna cover the different types of radioactive decay that can happen to an atom and how to calculate the half-life of that decay given a table or a figure. These questions come up a lot on the MCAT and can take a lot of time if we're not efficient with how we read the question and how we understand the information that we're provided. I will forewarn you that I do not use the radioactive decay equation. I personally find this thing to be messy and difficult and honestly takes longer than just doing the radioactive decay calculations by hand. So that's what we'll be doing today. And we'll be, of course, walking through it by doing a MCAT style practice question first. Let's get started. Go ahead, read this question, pause the video, and give it a try on your own first. Once you've reached a stopping point, come on back and we'll walk through the content and the strategy together. Okay, so 100 grams of strontium-90 undergoes beta minus radioactive decay with a half-life according to the figure below. What is the product after two half-lives? In order to correctly answer this question, we need to know the different types of decay and what that means in terms of the periodic table shift for the products, and we need to be able to correctly calculate radioactive decay using this figure. We're gonna start with the types of decay, we're gonna build out a chart first, and then we'll go ahead and talk about the half-lives. I like to put a chart together for the types of decay so I can easily see the differences between each one, and I'm going to try to write them in words that make sense to me instead of the symbols and figures that often show up in your book. Let's start at the top with alpha decay. Alpha decay is denoted by the Greek letter alpha, and it's when a nucleus of an atom emits two protons and two neutrons. Two protons and two neutrons is also known as the helium nucleus. So you'll often hear alpha decay described as emitting a helium nucleus. The helium nucleus is also called the alpha particle. So all three of these things are synonyms, two protons and two neutrons, the helium nucleus, and the alpha particle. Whatever the question says, what they're referring to is alpha decay. So now let's think about this in terms of what's happening to the atom. Let's say we have sulfur, and sulfur is undergoing alpha decay. Well, if we think about the atomic number, the atomic number is the number of protons and we're losing, we're emitting, removing two protons from the nucleus. So what does that mean the product will be if we remove or lose two in our atomic number? If we look at a periodic table, we'll see that two to the left or two less in an atomic number from sulfur is silicon. So our periodic shift, regardless of our starting material, is always going to be two to the left of where we started. So whenever they ask you about the decay product of alpha decay, we're shifting two to the left on the periodic table. I'll give you a hint. This shift is often what's tested on the MCAT. So it's a really great thing to have in your notes, not just the definitions of the different types of decay. We're now gonna swing all the way down to the bottom to a type of decay that's not nuclear decay, but still comes up and is part of this category. And that is gamma decay. Gamma decay is denoted by the Greek letter lambda, or a gamma, and what we're emitting here is not a proton or a neutron, this is a photon, a photon or light. Light is also known as electromagnetic radiation, EM radiation, EM rad is what I wrote here. So just know photon, light, electromagnetic radiation, they're all describing the same thing, which is this little packet of energy that moves in a waveform that's known as a photon. Now, where does this come from? It comes from a high energy electron orbital. So again, we're not in the nucleus anymore. We go from a high energy orbital and that electron moves down to a low energy orbital, releasing, again, that photon, that light, or that energy. Again, all of these words are kind of saying the same thing. This is also the Bohr model, right, of emission and absorption. So this is probably familiar from basic atomic theory. It's important to know, though, that when we're emitting energy, we're not emitting any kind of proton or neutron or electron. We're not really changing the character of this atom. So we're not going to see a shift on the periodic table. The atom will remain as it is, just at a lower energy state. Before we move on to beta decay, I want you to look at the difference between the alpha and gamma decay types. In alpha decay, we're emitting a whole two protons and two neutrons. Relatively speaking, that is a lot of mass to emit from a atom. So it's pretty heavy, relatively speaking again, and it's gonna move slowly. So alpha decay radiation can actually be stopped by a piece of paper. So it's not super fast, and it's definitely not dangerous. If we were bombarded by alpha particles, they wouldn't make it through our skin. 
On the other hand, we have gamma decay. And if we think about the word gamma, that's referring to the type of light or the type of electromagnetic radiation that is emitted. Gamma rays are the highest energy rays we have. They're all the way on the end of our electromagnetic spectrum. Super high energy, super high frequency, low wavelength. High energy radiation or high energy photons can definitely move quickly and get into our cells. So gamma radiation is actually quite dangerous to us because gamma radiation, kind of like UV radiation, can cause mutations and changes to our DNA. If you're a fan of Marvel, gamma radiation is how we got the Hulk. So it's definitely dangerous and not something we're going to use in a therapeutic capacity on humans. Similarly, we're not going to use alpha decay either because it can't make it into our bodies and we're not able to visualize it through our bodies. So our next type that we're going to talk about, beta decay, is really what we're going to see in our most of our lab work. And gamma decay and alpha decay is going to be more on like the physics side of things where we're using it in a very protected lab, but not on human bodies. All right, let's now talk beta decay. We have beta decay as a category, which is denoted by the Greek letter beta. Beta decay is when we're removing subnuclear particles, so even smaller than protons and neutrons, and we're emitting them in order to change the character of our nucleus. So we have two different types, but both of them are going to be looking at subnuclear particles. We have beta plus decay, and we have beta minus decay, which I'll do in a slightly different color green. Let's start with beta plus decay. So beta plus decay, we emit what's called a positron. A positron is the same size as an electron and just positively charged instead of negatively charged. So we're emitting a positron from a proton. And what happens here is that proton then loses its positive character, right? This is a positively charged positron. So when that positron says, hey, I'm leaving, I'm losing that positive character, what does the proton become? it becomes a neutron. So we go from a proton to a neutron, and this is our product. We also emit what's known as a neutrino. A neutrino is just like a balancing subparticle. You really don't need to know much about it for the MCAT other than it exists and it's emitted in beta plus decay. Let's go back to our periodic table to think about what happens if we convert a proton to a neutron. So let's go back to our friend sulfur. If our sulfur atom had a proton and then it becomes a neutron, that means we're doing minus one on the atomic number. Remember, atomic number is just the number of protons. So if we lose one, where are we shifting? We're shifting one to the left, which means our sulfur atom becomes phosphorus. And this is true for any type of beta plus decay. We're gonna move one to the left. Now let's talk about beta minus decay. Again, we're still messing with the subnuclear particles, but kind of in the opposite direction. So in this case, we're actually emitting an electron. Now I want to reinforce here, we're emitting an electron, we're just calling it an electron because it's negatively charged, it has the same mass, but it's not from our electron cloud, our electron orbitals. Remember, this is nuclear decay. All of these are nuclear decay, which means we're emitting like a negatively charged particle that we call an electron, from the nucleus. So we're not changing the number of electrons. So if we're emitting an electron from the nucleus, we're actually emitting that from a neutron. A neutron has both positive and negative character. When it loses its negative character, all that's left is its positive character. And so that neutron transforms to a proton, maintains the same mass roughly because electrons are super small and is now just positively charged. So it's now a proton. We also emit a antineutrino. Again, this is just our balancing particle here so that we don't really destabilize our nucleus. Um, again, you just need to know antineutrino is associated with beta minus decay. So if we go from a neutron to a proton, again, we go back to our periodic table and we're going now this time though, one to the right because we've added neutron to a proton, so we're now adding an atomic number. We're going one to the right on the periodic table. So if we have our friend sulfur as our initial reactant here in radioactive decay and it undergoes beta minus, what are we gonna get? Chlorine, really good, we're gonna get chlorine. So one to the right for any type of beta minus decay. Before we go back to our question, because now we have part of our answer, we have one more type that's a little different than all the others, and this is called electron capture. 
I want to hug the scientist that named this because it actually describes what's happening. Rather than all these alphas and betas and gammas, it's just saying, hey, electron capture, the nucleus is capturing an electron, usually from the environment, right? Not from its own electron orbital. So these electrons manage to get through all the way to our nucleus, and we actually absorb an electron. All right, so see how this is kind of different than all the others because the rest of them are emitting things and this one's absorbing an electron. And again, it's not absorbing energy, it's absorbing a full negatively charged particle all the way into the nucleus. And then that electron combines with a proton and forms a neutron, right? It basically cancels out that positive character, that proton absorbs the electron and neutralizes, so we end up with a neutron. So what does that look like? If we're going from proton to neutron, see so yeah, how that's very similar to beta plus decay? And functionally, the result is the same. We're gonna go one to the left on our periodic table with electron capture, but kind of for the opposite mechanism. Instead of emitting a positively charged particle, we're absorbing a negatively charged particle, but our end result is the same. We go from a proton to a neutron. As a test taking hint, our most common type of decay that you're likely gonna see on the MCAT is beta minus decay. And that's because we often use it to label molecules like carbons. We'll do carbon radio labeling or phosphorus radio labeling in our bodies or even in a lab to measure reactions and what's happening. Um, and this is a relatively safe type of decay that still allows us to visualize what's happening and what's going on by measuring the change from our reactant to our product. Now let's go back to the question and get to our halfway point because now we know the types of decay. So we have our strontium-90 and now we understand what they mean when they say it undergoes beta minus decay. So we know beta minus decay one to the right. right and that's what makes it into your notes and to your flashcards and to your memorization is beta minus decay one to the right on the periodic table. So let's look at where strontium is. Right, strontium is in row five, second over. And what's one to the right of strontium? Yttrium, all right? So our answers are definitely either A or B. We can eliminate C and D because these are describing rubidium as the product. And rubidium would be the product if we had beta plus decay. If the question stem had said beta plus decay, we would have picked rubidium as our answer here. And we would have chosen between C or D, but they didn't, it's beta minus. So again, yttrium is going to be our product if strontium-90 is undergoing beta minus decay. All right, we're halfway through the question. We now just need to talk about calculating half-lives. Before we do, I'm Amanda Brem, and I've been coaching pre-med students on their MCAT journeys since 2019. Please remember to subscribe to this channel for more videos on MCAT content, test-taking strategies, and mental fitness tips to help you perform your best on testing. And if you'd like more interactive lessons on topics like these, along with a supportive, collaborative community of students, and of course, a lot of me teaching, go ahead and check out our next available live online cohort in the caption below. All right, let's dive back in and finish out this question. Okay, we're down to A and B, and now we just need to determine what is the product amount, 25 grams or 75 grams, after two half-lives. So in order to do this, we first need to define half-life. A half-life is the amount of time it takes for our atom to decay 50% of its original amount. So however much we had, the amount of time it takes to get down to 50% of that amount, that's our half-life. When doing half-lives, we usually need to figure out what was our original amount. Our original amount when we started was 100 grams. So what would be 50% of that? Well, it would just be 50 grams. So now we need to determine how long in time did it take for us to decay all the way down to 50 grams. Remember, if we have 50 grams of strontium-90, that also means we have 50 grams of yttrium-90 product, right? It's a conservation of mass. We're not just disappearing this amount. We're converting it into our product, right? So they could have asked it in a different way. Just remember, however much we lose from our reactant is how much we're gaining with our product. So now we just got to go down to the chart and we want to use our Y axis here, which indicates our grams. And we can see that we have this exponential decay curve, right? Because for half-lives, we're dividing by two, dividing by two, dividing by two, but we're never going to get down to zero. We're just going to get infinitesimally small halves, right? Just as if you're like folding a paper, right? And you fold it in half and fold it in half and fold it in half. We're never going to disappear the paper. It's just going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So let's start, we started with 100 and that was at time zero. So now let's see where we ended up time-wise when we had 50 grams. Remember that's half 
of our original amount, our 50%. So we go across, find our data point, drop down, a look at that, we have 25 years. So our half-life for strontium-90 undergoing beta minus decay is 25 years. And this is going to stay true no matter how much we start with. All right, so we could start with 5,000 grams, we could start with 20 grams, and it will still be 25 years to get to half of that amount. So let me show you the pattern here. When we go, we're now 50 grams is our original, our starting material, and then half of that would be 25 grams, right? That's another half-life. We know that that needs to take 25 years, so we should see, yep, all right, when we get down to 25 grams, we've now gone 50 years or two half-lives, all right? So this is one half-life, two half-lives, three half-lives, four, right? Because 75 is 25 times three, 100. 25 times 4. And so what we should see is each half-life takes half of the amount before it. That's all this graph is showing us. So our question here is what is the product after two half-lives? So we can go here, 100 to 50 is 1, right? And so that gives us 25 years. Two half-lives is 50 years, and we now have 25 grams of strontium-90. So if we have 25 grams of strontium-90, and due to conservation of mass, we can't have lost any, how many grams of yttrium-90 do we have that we've created? You said 75, you are absolutely correct, right? Because these two numbers need to add up to equal 100, because 100 is our starting material. So our answer here is B. You'll notice I didn't use the radioactive decay equation here. That's because, in my opinion, it's a lot easier to just go through and divide by 2 and divide by 2 from the original amount rather than trying to plug in the numbers into the correct equation and use that complex uh, division and fraction thing. It's easier just to divide by 2 and do it out manually. Now remember, the MCAT loves to try out new ways to ask the same kind of question. Rather than asking, how much yttrium do we have after two half-lives? They could have asked, how much strontium-90 do we have after two half-lives? And again, that would just be taking the original amount of 100, dividing by 2, 50, that's one half-life, dividing by 2 again, 25, 25 grams, right? Now, a slightly trickier way they could ask this question is not actually giving you the half-life. They could say something like, we had 100 grams of strontium-90 to start with. And after 50 years, we had 25 grams of strontium-90. What was the half-life? So now they're not giving us the half-life, but they are giving us the start and the end point and the amount of time total it took. So we actually do the same process. You start with the original amount, divide by 2. That gets you to 50 grams. We know that's one half-life, whatever that is. But that's not our final amount, so we have to keep going. So now we go again, 25 grams. Oh, we made it to our final amount, and what did that take us? Two half-lives. So 50 years equals two half-lives, right? So what do we need to do? We just need to divide by 2, and that's going to give us one half-life. So 50 divided by 2, 25 years, equals one half-life. So again, a lot of this is just gathering the right information and understanding the core definition of what a half-life is, and of course the different types of radioactive decay that can come up on the MCAT. I hope that was helpful for you. Please feel free to add your additional radioactive decay and half-life questions in the comments below. And as always, happy studying!